Hey everyone, my name is Derek Ford and I've been a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation since 2007. And since 2016, I've been the lead editor of Liberation School. I'm really excited to introduce a new Liberation School interview series and the first one at that. The series consists of interviews, either through the form of video or text of leading radical scholars, organizers, and activists that we think can provide ideas, concepts, histories, and different knowledges and approaches that will help people on the left gain new insights. We have several interviews lined up. Some of them are with academics who are also activists or organizers. The PSL doesn't necessarily endorse everything that they say, but, um, we do believe that their work is valuable to the movement at large and people need to know the, their ideas. In this first interview in the series, we're absolutely honored to have Dr. Sharice burden Stelly or Dr. CBS. She's a critical black studies scholar of political theory, political economy and intellectual history. Her first book was co-authored with Gerald Horn titled W.E.B. Du Bois, A Life in American History. Her research primarily focuses on uh, transnational entanglements of US racial capitalism, anti-communism and anti-black structural racism. She has two books forthcoming. The first one uh, is titled Black Scare slash Red Scare, Anti-Blackness, Anti-Communism and the Rise of Capitalism in the United States. And another one, which is being edited with our comrade Joey Dean titled Organize, Fight, Win, Three Decades of Political Writing by Black Women Communists. She doesn't just write, of course, uh, she's also a member of the coordinating committee and the co-lead of the research and political education team at Black Alliance for Peace. She is also the host of the podcast, The Last Dope Intellectual, which is part of the Black Power Media Network. You should definitely check out. She's interviewed in what follows by PSL member Chris Dilworth of the Indianapolis branch, who played a key role in the anti-racist, anti-police uprisings last summer here that brought the movement and the struggle to a level that it really hasn't reached in a long time. So we're sure that you're gonna enjoy the interview and we ask that you stay tuned for future Liberation School interviews. Okay, so, um, so recently we've seen a surge or resurgence in the popularity of socialism or at least, you know, the word socialism. And, and, and with that, we've seen a resurgence of anti-socialist, you know, propaganda, a lot of red baiting, and there are a lot of different, you know, aspects and facets that are uh, tailored to different sectors that are part of our, you know, our struggle. So even during 2016, you know, there was a root article saying that, you know, black communists in the US were st stooges of the Kremlin. And even during the uprisings, you know, just this past summer, there was a lot of, you know, it's, it's Russian interference and all these kinds of things. Um, so can you talk about how anti-communism and anti-black racism exists in support of one another and talk a little bit about the historical roots of it? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of my work is geared on um, making this connection and the ways in which, you know, so I argue really can't understand anti-blackness without understanding anti-radicalism and vice versa, because, you know, you know, the quip is the thing that the United States hates more or as much as black people is radicals. And so, of course, we can trace this all the way back to the Alien and Sedition Acts when um, the United States government simultaneously moved to sort of um, suppress radical dissent by um, curbing the rights of like foreigners, especially those who came from uh, the French Revolution. And there was also the part bound up in the Alien and Sedition Acts was consternation about uh, the Haitian Revolution and the ways in which persons who were exiles from Haiti and brought along with them their enslaved Africans, um, the ways that those enslaved Africans might you know, so up, so dissent in the the mainland African population, and so there was a way in which the fear of that form of radicalism was sutured to the preservation of the slave system, and that is to say, the unfreedom of Black people. And so, in that way, so like you know, the United the the American Counter Revolution was 1776. Um, you know, the Articles of Confederation or the Constitution are what 1781. Uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts are 1789. So this is right at the founding of the United States that we already see this sort of fear of radicalism 
um, as a menace to property, right? Because of that, at this time, enslaved Africans are property. And that uh, fear of radicalism being connected to the continued subjection of African people. Um, so in my work, I focus on more so on the 20th century, but even in the late 19th century, see the, the state targeting um, socialist parties and primarily these socialist parties like in places like Ohio were made up of German immigrants and, and other immigrants. And so the US is xenophobic too, you know, anti-immigrant. But also what was dangerous about these parties is that they were interracial. And at least on paper, they, they promoted racial equality. And so that is, of course, anathema to the United States, which is rooted in racial hierarchy with Black people at the bottom. Um, also, we see the targeting of anarchists and the industrial workers of the world in the late 19th century. And so all of this targeting of radicalism and labor is very much linked to this fear of interracial organizing and this fear of black people um, being socially equal, but also being able to, um, to uh, move economically in the way that white folks do. And so by the Bolshevik revolution of 1917, there's a way in which, so, so previous to the Bolshevik revolution of 1917, there's this whole discourse about black pro-Germanism during World War I and immediately before and the ways in which the Germans were sewing up dissent in, in the African-American population and this, this real fear that Black people were going to side with the Germans as a sort of internal fifth column against the United States. And so people like um, A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen were actually incarcerated uh, for, for an article they wrote that was construed as like pro-Germanism. But interestingly, anti-blackness actually saved them because they thought, you know, the, the U.S. state was like, well, these are Negroes. There's no way they came up with this on their own. Of course, it is the immigrant, the white immigrants, right, who are who who actually wrote this and who are inspiring the Negroes to be rebellious. And so, of course, this 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 idea that black people are uniquely susceptible to foreign intrigue or to foreign influence has to do with this idea that black people are docile childlike, uh, we can't think for ourselves, but at the same time are dangerous and criminal. And so um, for me, what I really look at is the ways in which fear of, whether it be Germanism or Bolshevism, so there was a seamless transition from this discourse of pro-Germanism to this discourse of pro-Bolshevism, -pro -Bol that endemic in these fears of these different types of foreign, uh, foreign uh, influence or subversion or sedition or whatever is the danger of Black people. And for me, this is rooted, and this is this is why I use the analytical framework of racial capitalism, because what it brings together is the U.S. as constitutively a racial hierarchy, and U.S. and, and constitutively a sort of a, a capitalist exploitative society. And so this is why both Black liberation and socialism menace the very foundations of the society, because socialism is the redistribution of, of wealth and resources, and Black liberation will mean the collapsing of the racial hierarchy. The redistribution of wealth and resources would also mean that the blacks get, you know, basic necessities as well, um, you know, and then um, relatedly the collapsing of um, of the racial hierarchy would then mean that black people have equal access to resources. And so, in my thinking, and even in the way that it plays out in like government documents through legislation, through the different ways that the three three branches of government target black people and radicals, I see these as intimately linked. That is to say, anti blackness and anti radicalism. And then finally, anti communism is just sort of the post-1917 enunciation of that broader history of anti-radicalism that I've glossed over here, such that, you know, the co communism becomes, let us say, like a metonym or a synecdoche for many other forms of radicalism, not least internationalism, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, um, labor organizing, you just say communist or fellow traveler, and that's a shorthand for this sort of dragnet of, of repression. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because um, I think the, especially the point about how, you know, they look at us as being docile, how like these are the our Negroes would never get out of line, you know, this outside mm -hmm. agitator thing. And, you know, 
this whole assault on the Capitol, you never heard them talk about how, you know, they were influenced by, you know, outside agitators or anything like that. It's always when black people stand up and say, hey, we want to assert our, our rights as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I guess Although they it, did, there were, you know, certain of these senators that try to say it was Antifa, right? So the anti-radicalism, oh, again, yeah. that it was Antifa that had infiltrated the ranks and were actually the ones who were, who were committing, you know, property crimes. So there is, there was an anti-radicalism, but to your point, which I think is a good one, is that white outrage and white disorder is seen as righteous, right? Because they're seen as the citizens and the sort of um, the righteous uh, inheritors of the system, whereas the Blacks, because we're always on the constitutive outside, any our dissent is necessarily an attack on the state, uh, because it's always in opposition. Same with radicals, right? Because radicalism is seen to be just complete, wholly foreign inspired and completely antithetical to the, the bourgeois liberal, quote unquote, democracy that we have here. All right, which is why they always say oh, they want to overthrow our government, you know, whenever Black people are just like, we want health care or something like that. It's like, oh, they want to overthrow mm -hmm. the government. That's the line they go to. So mm -hmm. so I guess, you know, as a follow-up to that, um, when we talk about policies that are aimed towards improving the material conditions of Black people, they're often chided as being too radical, and they're socialists, or they're communists, they're anti-American. Um, and, you know, if these policies that improve living conditions of Black people, Improve, improve the material conditions of Black people, if these policies are anti-American, then what exactly does that say about America? And how does that relate to how uh, progressive or radical politics are seen as sort of this rich, white, privileged ideology? And um, can you talk a little bit about how that contributes to the erasure of the Black radical tradition um, which I know that you are a you know scholar of, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so and, and and how does this link between the anti anti communism and anti black blackness and how that plays out uh, currently? Um, well, if I understand your question, I mean I will say right that at least in our current moment, a lot of the of leftism and especially black the black left and the black radical left is petty bourgeois. Um, whereas movements like uh, ADOS or other types of movements have a, a larger working class base. So that is a fact, but we also have to note that con uh, conservatism and counter-revolutionary forces like history is on their side, <laughs> inertia. So um, it is much, uh, it's much more uh, easier, it's much easier to sort of get people, ordinary people onto the side of, of something like, you know, um, a particular articulation of reparations that can be, you know, xenophobic and that can be very consonant with this America first, very conservative, very reactionary discourse than it is to, to get people to like on the side of like Karl Marx or whatever, or, or uh, Marxism, number one, because it's very, the analysis is very, it is uh, simple, but it's complex, right? And so, and there's so much in there, and it, it requires the undoing epistemologically, ethically, as well as materially of so much of what is, right? And so that is just, it's, it's very, very hard to fathom. But to your point about anti-communism, the other thing that happens is that, you know, the state will point to like communist societies around the world or social, excuse me, socialist societies around the world like Cuba, Venezuela, um, even, you know, even China and, and very, and demonize and criminalize them. In a place like Venezuela, for example, they will attribute the, the um, economic duress uh, that co currently constitutes the society to a fa failure of socialism, as opposed to the, the draconian sanctions that are imposed on Venezuela, precisely to have another example of socialist failure, because if there is a socialist success, then of course, that um, does not bode well for you know the discourse of capitalism as uh, you know the best and the most effective system, 
And, you know, the same goes for Cuba. There has been a, you know, an embargo against Cuba essentially effectively since the Cuban revolution in 1959. So, um, so there's a way, so there's this whole discourse of failure around socialism that I think that is so ingrained in how we're taught and what we know that is to be on the left, to be on the radical left, you have to undo a lot of that. And that's very, very difficult, especially because our economic conditions are such that people are just trying to survive and live day to day. And so the type, oftentimes the type of study, the type of, of sort of gathering together and collective political education is very, very difficult. And, and one needs to have political education to really grasp, um, to, to really grasp the sort of ideo the ideological component of, of this type of scrap class struggle in which we're engaged. So I guess, you know, to make a short story long, um, as I always do and always say, to get to, you know, the other aspects, uh, the other aspect of your question, like, what does it say about the United States that policies that are for the well-being of the most oppressed, that is to say Black people, are considered construed as anti-American. Well, it, it, it goes to show that the, the sort of ethics and ideals of the society, um, you know, so freedom is the freedom to die. Um, individualism is the right of particular individuals to succeed and to hoard wealth and to, to uh, be successful um, over and against the majority, right? And that the United States is very hostile to groups. It's very hostile mm -hmm. to the grassroots. It's very hostile to um, any sort of gathering together. This is especially when it's racialized, racialized marginalized, oppressed, uh, working and poor people, whether it's unions, right? Whether it's particular types of organizations that are then red baited, um, whether it is particular types of, of movements or, or, or protests or whatever. The US is very hostile to those groupings because of the, this sort of idea of individualism, because we know, they know that the, the main power that the masses have is like people's power. And when people get together, that is a, that's a threat to the ruling class. So, um, you know, and the last thing that I'll say is that, uh, you know, socialism is, <laughs> Capitalism is the rich and privileged ideology because capitalism, you know, capitalism is for liberalism, or I guess I'll just say liberalism is an ideology of the rich and the elite because it is it is the narration of sort of capitalist exploitation. Um, and there's a misconception that you have to be like learned and, you know, and, and degreed and studied to be a socialist. You do not, right? You simply have to understand, you know, you know, um, historical materialism, so to speak, and and what our material conditions are. But ordinary people understand that all the time. They just don't necessarily have the language. And, you know, they don't necessarily need the language. The language is helpful to sort of clarify and to, to push through the obfuscation. But um, we see it like when people are like, fuck this job, that's... <laughs> That is a particular type of consciousness, right? When people hate their job and they see, they they recognize the dissonance between how hard they work and the very low wages they make, there is, that's not necessarily a class consciousness, but it's the potential for that. And so I think that we just need to nurture that and to to show, to continue to show, to, to show the, the sort of, or reveal the heightened contradictions and show the ways that like, you're broke, capitalism not for you, and you'll always be broke, like, in this system, you'll never be Jay-Z or Beyonce. So, you know, stop having false class solidarity with those people, so. Yeah, well, everybody, I mean, everyone hates their job. Like, I don't know, I mean, there's very few people who really love what they do. Most people, you talk to them like, damn, I gotta go to work. Damn, it's Sunday, I gotta go to work on Monday. You know, people don't. It, so, I mean, this idea of them, people not having the language and sort of combating or unlearning all the miseducation that they've been given, what do we do? How do we fight against that? Especially with our own people, because that's what I find that is really tough for me because I do a, a lot of work trying to go home and talk to people, um, but it's really hard to get people like sort of off that reactionary path, even though they'll, they'll be sympathetic and they'll see and understand, but they're still, they're unable to sort of peel back those layers and move to, you know, to the left. So, I mean, how do we, what, what do we do to fight against that? You know, 
That's a great question. But I, you know, I think that we just, we have to continue with um, organizing and um, encourage our people to join particular types of organizations and, you know, meet people where they are politically. Um, and, and just, again, point out just the everyday contradictions, because it is true that many of our people believe, for example, when there are when there's police brutality or, or these police murders, like there is a sort of inclination to ask, like, well, what do they do? And mm -hmm. well, they shouldn't have been doing this or that. That That is a constant reframe. But what we need to, you know, part of what we can reveal is that the police are occupying forces and they criminalize our behavior. They criminalize our efforts to survive because that's their job. Their job is to protect private property and to, to defend um, private property and to defend the interests of the ruling elite. And so, you know, you just, you can point that out, um, you know, simply by, you know, because there, you know, there are situations when, you know, pe the police are kind of everywhere and they're just jacking everybody up, right? It doesn't matter how people are acting. It doesn't matter what they're doing. It doesn't matter what they're wearing. It is simply the police, the, the job of the police is to be hostile to black people. And so um, it's, it's, you know, it's just, that's our historical task. We just have to keep at it. Um, but what I will say is that we need to take the sort of American and African American seriously that there are, you know, radicals are a very, very small minority um, in this country. And, you know, we have the weakest working class movement in the world, like because of the endemic anti-radicalism, because of the ways in which this true Americanism has stood in for a Marxist or a class analysis. Um, and because of the ways in which white supremacy is a class co a class collaborationist project. And so I think that with our people, like, we just got to keep at it. And because, like I said, I think that we know these things intuitively, but there is a sort of Americanism that people believe, you know, I, I always talk about at this point, apparently I say it every time, it's like the but for logic that many of our people believe that the United States would be the greatest country in the world, but for racism. Um, right, um, but for the marginalization of Black people from being able to fully participate, as opposed to seeing the system that there is, racism is the system. There is no outside to that. It's, it's endemic in capitalism itself, um, especially especially the sort of U.S., the ways in which the U U.S. society has developed economically and politically. And so um, that's just a long way of saying, like, I don't have any solutions. <laughs> I'm still trying to understand the problem. But I think just pointing again, pointing out the everyday and ordinary ways that um, we're suffering, like we're fucked up out here. And, you know, oftentimes we want, we choose the enemy we know. We prefer that to the enemy we don't know. Um, and so people, so people rather have capitalist suffering than the potential for sort of socialist flourishing. So um, and I'll, the other thing I'll say too is that we, you know, we have quotidian practices of socialism through things like mutual aid, but it's always in times of of, of duress or crisis. So, for example, the the Arctic storm in uh, Texas and and that hit the South, but Texas and Jackson, Mississippi, particularly hard. We always mobilize in those times of crisis, crisis, and even in COVID. But we need to show that this is the way we should be relating all the time and be linked that just from crisis. So it's not just a, a reactive or responsive thing, but rather we actually are better off and we actually survive and move toward thriving when we act collectively and cooperatively. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's an ongoing struggle, but I think organizations are doing it all the time through mutual aid, through um, through political education, and through actually providing like real services um, and addressing the real needs of particular uh, communities. So we just gotta keep doing it. So as someone who is, you know, uh, you think deeply and critically and carefully about the relationship between race and capitalism, and, and I know you use the framework of racial capitalism a lot, what are the problems that you see with the way that they are pre presented, dominantly presented, and how can we combat this presentation? Yeah, so on the race side, we have to avoid like what uh, my comrade uh, Erica Keynes calls identity reductionism and, and race reductionism, whereby we combat or we challenge white supremacy, but with no class consciousness whatsoever, whereby we'll equate like um, a bourgeois Negro getting followed in the store with 
poor black people getting murdered by the cops as if these are two sides of the same coin and they are not right because oftentimes these people who are these up these elite black elites who are um, experiencing these sort of um, episodes of 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 interpersonal racism are the very people who are invested in the system and they're mad that they have done everything quote unquote right they're at the top of the meritocracy and yet and still they're experiencing they're they're inconvenienced or their feelings are hurt by racism that is a different a, a that is a materially and sort of qualitatively different reality than people who are murdered by the cops people who are brutalized um, by their employers, by their landlords, and by just just for being in the world, and, and there's a particular way in which violence and and brutality accrue around those people because of their class um, in ways that you know black elites will never experience. So you know, and then you know, of, of course, black elites can then you know call up the press or they can call Barack Obama in the case of of Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, they can do those sorts of things where poor and working class black folks have no recourse, right? Um, so I think when we're having our race analysis, we need to constantly reveal the ways in which race is, is a sort of key technology within the context of capitalism without resorting to like race hustling or race reduction. On the class side, our leftist comrades need to realize that race is a thing it, it, it is not, and it's not, Race is not divisive because black people talk about race. Race is divisive because white people are fucking racist and because of white supremacy, period. And so it's not that we're talking about it, that's the problem. It's the fact that we have to constantly keep talking about it because it is an endemic experience in our everyday lives. That's the problem. And to say that black people need to be at the at the forefront or to say that, you know, black people are the vanguard as some do is not to say like that white people don't matter, but rather that if we only start with white people, there ain't no trickle down justice. It never has happened and it never will happen. But conversely, you know, what did they say? The 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 lowest boat lifts all tides or the tide lifts all boats or some shit. So if you start with black people who are uh, against whom violence and exploitation and oppression are legitimated, if you start with those people and you start with the the, the material conditions and the, the structural experiences that Black people have, that inevitably helps all people, right? It just, like, it just does. And right. so to help a Black person doesn't mean you leave out the white person in Appalachia. It means that you have to, the white person in Appalachia must realize that they have more in common with that oppressed black person than they do with white elites. And that is much harder for white people than it is for black people to, to recognize that, that class solidarity. And this just bears out historically. And so, you know, um, we have to, when we have our class analysis, we have to we have to stop seeing the race question or the Negro question or whatever as antithetical or or beyond or epiphenomenal of a a, a real or authentic or foundational class problem that these things are mutually constitutive. And I think we we when we use, when we say racial capitalism again, it's not to imply that there's a non-racial capitalism, and it's also not to imply that race is the only sort of a scriptive category that's important, but rather to point out that these things need to be these things need to be thought together because they mm -hmm. sort of ascend it together and they are they are are mutually constitutive. So, you know, um I think that uh our white comrades have a lot of work to do with regard to race. And then our, you know, our, you know, fellow black folks have work to do with re with regard to class because all skin ain't kin um and there are you know levels to this shit as they say and so even as we're censoring black people it's not the kamala harris's of the world it's not stacy abrams it's not amanda gorman it's not megan merkel it's the nameless black people <laughs> it's the people who are black. doing the organizing, right, well, you know, 
<laughs> where it's people who are doing the organizing and the people who are had the most acute um, suffering. So. Okay. So okay. Um, so you, you you talked about how um, a rising tide lifts all boats, and so I guess it would be uh, important to focus on Black women um, because. Uh, I guess as Claudia Jones talks about uh, the the triple um, oppression that Black women face. So, you know, can you talk about how the role of Black women in in in, in communist struggles and other pro progressive struggles and how they've been erased and co-opted and what we can do to sort of bring that back and reclaim them? Yeah. So, for example. I think it was yesterday, no, March 8th was like International Working Women's Day. Um, and it's, you know, now it's just IWD, but like the working is really important because again, this was born out, excuse me, born out of like labor struggles, women's, women's labor struggles, women's strikes and women's sort of uh, movement building. And, um, you know, I think that what we need to understand when we talk about centering women, what we have to understand is what I would call their the, their structural location or the political economy of their existence. We're not centering them because of their identity per se, or just because you know they're women as such, but because of the the convergences of oppression, as Claudia Jones you know talked about, black women being oppressed as women, as workers, and as black people, and like that is what's that is what is important about it. At the same time, we also need to guard against the Condoleezza Rices, the Susan Rices, and that ilk who are becoming, as I said elsewhere, like the mammies of empire. They're becoming the faces of reproducing the status quo. And so when we talk about, you know, paying attention to the plight of, of Black women in particular, it means addressing the concerns or addressing the issues that affect their day to day lives, whether it be housing issues healthcare, childcare, sexual violence, sexual assault, those sorts of things. But also keeping in mind that these things are not reducible to only women, but the, the experience and realities of black women tend to reveal and illuminate those realities, even as other groups might suffer from the, these forms of exploitation and oppression. And so, you know, part of what we need to do is when you know, when we're, we're talking about Black women or we're examining the lives of Black women is to really pay attention to their politics. We have to take Black women seriously because when we just conflate all Black women, that's reproducing a particular type of, um, of disrespect and injustice against these women because Black women are not all the same. And so an Asada Shakur should not be put in the same sentence, for example, as a Kamala Harris. Because um, they, they're, they're, freedom dreams, <laughs> you know, to use the term of Robin Kelly, are completely different. Their politics are completely different. Um, how they care for and think about Black people and oppress people more broadly is completely different. And so we, I don't think we just need to look to women willy-nilly. We need to look at the, look to the women who are really struggling for us, us being oppressed, marginalized, exploited, racialized people. Um, and, you know, historically they have, you know, they have been left out because of sexism, misogyny, and patriarchy, but we don't need to overcorrect and just say that any old woman, because she's a woman, ought to be a leader or ought to um, be dictating and determining what, where it is we need to go or what it is that we need to do. Um, and so I think that because that's a sort of, that's a, a kind of, that's a, um, a liberal identitarianism that's not helpful and not useful. How you get so, Kamala Harris. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, many, many, many others. And so um, I think that we need to disabuse ourselves of that and see that comrades come. What it is is that comrade, there is no body that makes you objectively revolutionary. Likewise, there is no body that should preclude you from being or becoming a comrade. And I think that that is what's most important. Um, and, you know, so in terms of, you know, how to, we need to challenge also intellectual McCarthyism, which conceals the radicalism of people generally, but, you know, Black people and Black women uh, uh, particularly, 
And so read people like Louise Thompson Patterson, Eslanda Good Robeson, uh, Claudia Jones, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Maud White Katz, um, Thelma Dale, uh, Queen Mother Audley Moore, Vicki Garvin, um, you know, the Black Women's United Front, the Sojourners for Truth and Justice, um, Grace Campbell, um, Williana Burroughs, et cetera. So, so Jody Dean and I are actually coming out with a collection of Black communist women's writings, roughly between about 1917 and 1957, basically, um, to sort of reveal the, like, what is the analysis that they were doing? Like, what was, what it was their political perspective? Because even as we know more and more about Black women, we know much less about these Black radical women, or, and especially these Black communist women or communist adjacent women, um, because, you know, you know the the stereotypes that you mentioned at the the beginning of this interview, like you know that the communists in general are stooges of the Kremlin, that they're foreign inspired, that they're not, you know, their politics are not actually in response to like lynching and anti-black violence and terrorism and repression and capitalist exploitation that they experience in their day to day life. So, you know, I I, I think um, we need to we definitely need to listen to. Black women who have our interests in mind and who have loved us and who have centered our, our flourishing and our liberation. Um, and then hold the Black women who have not done that and who are our enemies accountable. That's part of um, respecting Black women. How do we get people to, because, you know, it's, it, it seems like, you know, people say, listen to Black women, but the, they're not, they're listening to a certain type of Black women. It's usually, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and there's usually, a, a higher a class aspect to the black person that they're listening to, right? Like the Democratic Party, for example, listen to black women. But you know, you have like somebody like Brianna Joy Gray. They hated her, right? Um, even though, like, she may not have you know the best uh, um, class analysis, but they hated her because she was uh, trying to push, you know, for Bernie Sanders, right? So. How do we get people to say to listen to people like say Claudia Jones or you, for example, because uh, somebody who actually has the interests of black people at heart, as opposed to somebody like Kamala Harris, who has locked up black people, black mothers, has denied trans people um, um, or put them in uh, trans women in men's prisons and you know all these other horrible things. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we need to have more platforms and outlets for um you know people black uh, women black women with particular types of, of radical politics and people's centered interests and commitments so you know we have black power media that we started for example where people like myself and and uh the people's prophetess jackie luke Vaughn, um we're members of that i'm a jackie one. stan by the way yeah oh we we all are we stand for for jackie <laughs> period um you know, and, and, you know, Brianna, uh, she has her own, her, her platform, her podcast. And so I think that we just need more black left media in general that, that lifts up those voices. And, um, you know, I mean, I, and I think that what, what can be very difficult, I will say, like, especially coming from like my sort of position is that it often feels like I'm critiquing black women in particular. Um, which in the grand scheme of things like white supremacy, capitalism, like we have bigger fish to fry. But to me, I just, I love us and I expect so much more from us. And I think that that's part of the work is that we have to clear the rubble <laughs> to be able to even, to even have a space for, for radical black women. And so um, I take deep offense to um, the bourgeois black women who are just, you know, very much invested in reproducing the system and who hold themselves up and those like them as paragons of progress simply because they are in, you know, a position of relative power, right? Um, position, you know, power that is wholly reversible, mind you, power that is completely abstracted or disembedded from any community or any real commitment to, to liberation and to human flourishing. So, um, you know, and I, um, 
there's no, you know, and, and to a certain extent, I just feel like people like myself, we just need to, we don't necessarily need to talk, like, you know, we can just do stuff. And I think that those actions speak out. I also think we need to disabuse ourselves of the celebrity culture that we live in where we only listen to prominent people because there's some, you know, quote unquote, black leftists who are prominent who just run their fucking mouth. And I think, you know, and so I've always been very clear about the fact that I'm an academic. I don't have, I don't have a, until very recently, I was not in an organization. I, I did not have an organizing or activist background. I'm starting to develop that now. But, you know, um, you know, Walter Rodney says like, you know, intellectuals or academics are enemies of the people until proven otherwise. And I think that people like myself need to, to prove otherwise that we, you know, our, my historical task, I think, is as um, an intellectual to, to excavate these histories and these ideas, but at the same time, also be in, com in community and in, you know, movements and in organizations that are, that are doing our, you know, survival and thriving work. So, you know, Cabral talks about we have to um, tell no lies, expose lies when they're told, and tell no easy victory. And I think part of exposing those lies is holding up a mirror to the people who um, who spit on our cupcake and tell us it's frosting, so to speak. Yeah, it's it's funny because um, that's it's kind of like why I joined the PSL. And I first heard you when you were on Devin's podcast on the Groundings talking about um, W. B. Du Bois. And Devin was also talking about how you need to join an organization because I, I wasn't a part of an org. I just always in my room reading books, just mad as hell, like Democrats. I hate these, you know, I hate to, you know, I was just mad, but I wasn't doing nothing. Um, then I was like, okay, I need to get out here, you know, join an org, do something. And that's been one of the best decisions that, you know, I've ever made because mm -hmm. actually being out in the community um, with the people uh, and fighting for the things that you want to see has really been sort of, I guess, liberating in a way. Um, and so I guess, so, and so I'll go to the, the, to piggyback off your point about the celebrities. Um, so, uh, so pro professor, oh, well, not professor, but legal scholar, Derek Bell, um, he once said that um, America, American racism uh, anti-blackness, white supremacy, that these were permanent fixtures of American society. So, uh, you know, when uprisings occur in the wake of America's, uh, I would call the ongoing genocide against black people, uh, political leaders, the political establishment, they treat it as a temporary crisis, as, as something to, to, to manage. It's a PR problem, right? So they call in their uh, metaphorical uh, Olivia Pope to, to, to manage this crisis. They don't treat it as a permanent structural problem that's been going ongoing. Um, and the Olivia Pope in this case would be the, you know, black misleadership class, the, the Clyde bums, as you always like to call them, mm -hmm. <laughs> Kamala, the TIs, the Jay-Z's, the killer mics. Um, so I guess, so, so what do you think about his, uh, Derek Bell's analysis that the enduring character of America is white supremacy? And can you talk about how these Olivia Popes uh, get propped up in times of crisis to be the managers of our struggle? Yeah, well, historically, if we look at interracial class formation, there has always been a black managerial class. So if we go, you know, back to Booker T. Washington, for example, that was his exact role was not only to um, be the, the broker for Black people, but also to shut down any opposition. And so oftentimes the debate between, let us say, William Monroe Trotter and Booker T. or W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington is reduced to industrial education versus liberal arts education. But that's not the, the you know, there's not a dichotomy there they both believed in both to a certain degree. Because if we look at T Tuskegee Institute, for example, they trained mostly teachers. They weren't training a lot of bricklayers or whatever, right? Because the political economy had changed and many, many other factors. But um, what Du Bois and Will William Monroe Trotter and others were against was like that, the way that Booker T. Washington would stop people's bags, so to speak. Like he would get, he would shut down presses. He would prevent people from getting jobs. He would prevent people from, you know, being able to, um, 
to voice any opposition. And like, as black people, we can't afford that. We need to have all hands on deck. Now, of course I'm against uh, black liberalism and black, you know, the NGOs and all that. I, I think that that's ultimately a detriment, but I think the, maybe the day-to-day -day, like aid or resources that might they might provide is useful to a certain degree, but we certainly can't have, um, you know, we can't support anything that shuts down ideas that challenge the status quo because that will always be to the detriment of black people because the status quo is white supremacy and capitalism, capitalist exploitation and human suffering, period. That is, that is the status quo. And so I, you know, I agree with with uh, with Baba Derek Bell from you know from his ideas about interest convergence to you know his ideas about um racial realism, which is part of what you're talking about, that, you know, white supremacy is real, like, and it, it, um, it, it morphs and changes. So, so like post-racialism and multiculturalism are just one, a different regime of like racial formation or a different regime of white supremacy, so to speak. Um, and, you know, there's always, so there's always going to be that black buffer class that, that, niggerati, so to speak, that's meant to, number one, convey a, a sort of linear progress narrative that we've moved from slavery to freedom, um, and that these people, these success, quote unquote, success stories are a manifestation of that. But they're all, and they're also meant to obfuscate the lived reality of Black people, which is, you know, we top the charts and, you know, every, like, you know, educational, uh, the, the lack of educational attainment, um, poor health indicators, poor housing, et cetera. And that this is not a moral, a moral or biological failure of black people, this is the system. And I think that that's something that's really, really important. It seems very obvious, but too often we attribute it to culture or to ethics or to, you know, other things as opposed to the, to the, the structure of the system itself. And I think that that black managerial class, um, the black, you know, the the black elected official class, the misleadership class, helped to um, legitimate that narrative. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we have to. It's it's the task of liberation is very difficult because you have to challenge the white folks, right? The the white races. You have to challenge the well-meaning liberals who theoretically, who think they're on your side, but then reproduce all of the same systems just much more nicely. You have to challenge the, the niggerati or the, the, the comprador class, so to speak, right? Because they also are doing things that require Black folks to negotiate the terms of our immiseration, Black and other oppressed people. So it's a, and then you have to sort of try to root out the, <laughs> the bullshit that even that black, the black masses and black work, like black masses, but also, you know, working people in general believe, because there's a lot of that too. And so we can't just have, like, we can't just have this idealistic understanding of, of populism or of the quote unquote masses. And this was, you know, or pet, you know, peasant group, whatever the groups are. So this is, for example, Cabral's critique of Fanon. Um, we have to do the work in those communities. We can't evade that work by just assuming that because these people are oppressed that they're automatically going to be with the shits. That's not true. Um, so it's a lot, there's just a lot of work that we have to do. Uh, but certainly part of that work is to root out the people who make our job exponentially harder by, um, you know, selling, selling us this idea of, of progress and um, of, of black excellence, if you will, that is you know, built on the backs of, of people who, who will never be able to attain that and, and who see those standards as bullshit anyway, so. It's like this, I did it, you can do it type of thing. Like, <clears throat> you know, Jay-Z, the narrative of his, you know, his success. Um, and I, don't, I always wonder like, you know, what's worse between somebody like, you know, Clybum and a Jay-Z and, you know, as much as I despise Clyburn for making Joe Biden president, um, 
Jay Z's, the Killer Mike's, their misleadership, I feel, especially during times of struggle, tends to carry more weight. So it's a little bit more, I guess, um, problematic or poisonous uh, because they have these Horatio Alger or these rags to riches stories and those kind of narratives about, you know, being able to do to achieve anything, even you're black, but I can do it. You can do it because I did it kind of a thing. And I think that those kinds of, I would say that those kinds of narratives actually end up hurting the people they're supposed to help. Like you're supposed to be, you're trying to motivate people through this, but your achievement is actually used against poor black folks, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what, like, do, do you like, is there a, I mean, if, 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 if there's even a worse between the two, like, would, do you think that it's worse, that it's more, I guess, problematic for, for the, uh, with the Jay-Z's or the Clyburn's? Like, what, I, I don't know, do you have a thought on that at all? I would say Jay-Z's ideology is more influential. He has a larger platform. And so there's a way in which, um, his message is disseminated in to a broader audience, but somebody like Clyburn, he's a power broker. And so it is, it is people like him and people who are in Congress who are responsible, for example, for us not having a, a $15 minimum wage and for even setting the, the 15 as a standard in the first place when it should be more like 24 or $28. Um, these are the people who um, who helped to put people like Biden or Harris in place who just lie, straight up lie to people, right? Who say that you're gonna get these $2,000 survival tech checks and then it's $1,400 and it's already been two months and they have, they have not gone out, right? And also like 17 million less people will get them because of these, you know, and, and then people will say, well, that's not them. That's the, that's the, you know, the, Republicans and then the 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 dinos the Democrats in name only, but these, but in the final analysis, people like Clyburn, and even even the quote unquote the squad or whatever, they're still playing this political game, and these are the people who are pushing this idea that electoral politics is actually going to change, <laughs> our our, or is the most important way of changing our material realities, and we know that's that's not the case at all. And so both, I think both people are selling dreams. So Jay-Z is selling this dream that if you work hard and you just do the right things, or if you hustle, you know, like fucking Steve Harvey talk about don't sleep eight hours. Like if you do that, then you could, you have the potential to be successful and, and buy your mama a house or whatever. The, the political, the BEOs, right? The political class, they're selling the dream that, you know, if you vote, if you just vote, if you wait in these hours long lines to just vote, then your conditions will change, right? And so we hold up people like Stacey Abrams, who did a lot um, to challenge like restrictive voting laws. And that's great. You know, that, you know, that's great because like, people should be able to vote if they want to. But right. the problem is that she's funded by the very same corporations, the very same um, political action groups who are invested in maintaining the status quo so that that whole whipping up votes or, or you know registering people to vote just becomes performative, right? Um, it's not necessarily, it doesn't result in substantive change because let me tell you something, people waited in those long ass lines to vote for Ossoff and Warnock. And that was supposed to be the game changer. They still owe me $1,400. And in fact, like, you know, whatever. So, you know, um, I think that they're both selling different types of dreams and both of those dreams are rooted in this idea that, you know, our current system is salvageable, which it's not. It, you know, it's also funny because, you know, Trump wanted people to have $2,000 checks, right? He's gonna use the fact that the Democrats just straight lied when he runs for president again. It's gonna be like, they lied to you. I mean, they're, it's, the politics that they're playing is just idiotic from just any sort of standpoint. It makes no sense that they're just being losers. So this idea that, you know, we all we need to do is vote for, you know, the Democrats and that's what's going to happen. I mean, as a as a someone who has, you know, 
the scholar of Du Bois, I mean, he talked about why he wouldn't vote. And it's the same shit, right? Uh, today, as it was then, that we're on this hamster wheel and we have to get off of this hamster wheel and do other things. It can't just be voting. That's not going to bring liberation for Black people because we've been doing that. And we don't have progress. We don't have anything to show for it, except we keep getting these, you know, putting white people in power who don't want to help black people, who don't want to improve the material conditions of black people. Um, yeah, and these so are guess- people who are willing to suffer. These are people, we have, the other thing about voting is that, you know, whatever, what was it, 70 billion, 78 million people voted for Trump. So voting is not objectively progressive, right? And, you know, it's this idea and it's, you know, people will point to the fact, well, all the people who turned out to vote defeated those factions, did they? Because now what we see the Biden administration doing is like, he really wants the Republicans to be his friend. Like he really wants that. And the Republicans have always been like, fuck y'all. We don't, we don't fuck with y'all. We not, we not capitulating to y'all. We not doing no across the aisle. You can't sit with us. No, but because of but you know but but the administration that has been put in place that's his main objective is this bipartisanship and it's not even though it's not going to happen even though it's to the detriment of the majority of people and so you know the the old dude from west virginia i forgot his name who voted against the 15 dollar minimum wage yeah like West Virginia is broke as fuck. They don't, they, these are, this is a former coal mining state. Like they are completely deindustrialized, economically destitute. And yet, and still, because he got, he's rich, right? He's voting against, or he is sort of, these representatives don't represent the people either, right? I think something um, like 16% of West Virginians live under the poverty line, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So Jack, you know, you know, Jackie spoke about this in one of her monologues um, last week. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, this whole, this, and it's not just, it's the duopoly, it's voting within a duopolistic system that's actually the problem because if we had a party, a party that was a workers party, a party that actually represented people, and represented black people because we cannot act like a lot of these white workers are not racist. So if we had a white workers party, that would not do shit for like racialized people, period. Like, I mean, we have to disavow ourselves with this idea that just because white people are poor, that 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 means they'll have some sort of solidarity with black people. No, what they have proven over time is that they will be poor as long as the black people don't have shit either. This is history. This is a historical fact that we constantly have, like we like to evade because it's a hard truth. But yeah, the the voting, the the voting in the two party system. I'm not gonna say it's a waste of time, but I feel like what it, it needs to be put in its proper context, and it need like we need to stop this vote or die. And you know, because the black elites are invested in that shit because they feel like you know, first of all, they you know they they get paid for running these types of campaigns, and because you know whatever the system is, is going to be in their favor because they got a lot of money. And so, you know, they have an, an a vested interest, but they need us like ordinary people to, um, to do their bidding. So. Or this reduction of our ancestors, or our forebears to, you know, they, they died so that we could vote. I mean, that's really disrespectful to the legacy of, you know, um, many black radicals who come before us. So, all right. So, since we're coming up on time, I, get, I'll, I had to skip some questions, but I got uh, one last question for you. Um, so how do you see your role as a, I, I know you say you're not, you know, you don't have an organizing bone in your body, um, but how do you see your role as a black studies professor, a researcher and an activist? Um, and what advice would you give to those who are moving into academia or moving into organizing from academia? Mm-hmm. So I would never say I don't have an organizing bone in my body because organization is not, you know, organization, if anything, is a muscle, it's something that could be built up, organizing, and it's also a commitment. And so I, I just say I don't have an activist or organizing background, which is to say oh, I'm yeah, my bad. academic. But, you know, I would say that I'm getting organizing experience just by, you know, in my beloved Black Alliance for Peace and, um, you know, and working on campaigns, doing, you know, being on the research team and being just being in community with people with similar politics who let you know you're not crazy. But, you know, as a Black, you know, and as a, I would just say, 
as a Black Studies scholar, it's really important because Black Studies, at least in its origins, was a, a counter hegemonic. It was an insurgent interdiscipline. It was a challenge to traditional disciplines that were rooted in white supremacy and Eurocentrism and, and you know, foundational to the ways in which the academy serves as the intellectual arm of the state, which it still does. And, and Black Studies has migrated from those those radical or activist roots. But for me, because I'm trained in Black Studies, part of my dissertation uh, is written about Black Studies. I've worked in Black Studies departments, like everything about me is Black Studies and is committed to that sort of original vision and idea, um, not least the sort of counter, the counterinsurgent um, part of it and the part that demands that we have courage in what we do and that we produce things that are relevant for not necess not the world as is, but the world as we see that it ought to be. And that inevitably means paying attention to the world around us, both nationally and internationally, as well as locally. It means listening to and being attentive to what um, is going on with people like outside of our, outside of the ebony tower, so to speak. Um, it means, you know, being questioned driven and following, you know, and, and producing work that matters and helping to make that work accessible and sort of democratizing our access and resources and understanding that being, for me, being an academic is a responsibility. And so I have a responsibility to, again, democratize knowledge, to redistribute particular types of resources and to, to do work that will be useful for people who um, are not in the academy, who have no desire to be in the academy, but who are doing other, you know, um, who are doing other types of work. And so um, that's the that's the project of Black Studies, I would say, you know, and um, it's still alive in various ways. It has, you know, through its professionalization and institutionalization, it's, it's moved away from that, that vision of like gown and town or more relevant education, so to speak. But I think that there are many people who are still committed to that project um, and who are, um, you know, who really are committed to the the intellectual project of building a better world. And I, I would like to see myself, um, you know, I like to, to think that I'm, I'm part of that sort of intellectual tradition. That you most definitely are. Um, and uh, appreciate you taking the time. Um, I don't want to hold you up too long because I know you have something at seven. Um, but I know Walter Rodney has critiques of um, the, the, the Black Studies just about how it had changed and had been sort of co-opted that I read a long time ago. I'm not a scholar, by the way, I'm just a hood dude. I'm not a scholar. I don't, you know, I came to this on my own, just reading and, and living. So, um, how, how are you not a scholar then? I'm just, uh, I just, cause I really didn't spend time, I guess, in school studying this stuff, you know? So neither did John Henry Clark scholar that has, you know, you're not an academic, but you don't have formal training doesn't mean you're not a scholar. But anyway, what are you saying? <laughs> true, true, true. Um, but no, I was just saying that, um, you know, through reading a bunch of Black radicals is how, you know, I develop my politics and mm -hmm. always want to figure out a way to get our people there because that's that's my ultimate goal is, you know, raise the conscience of our people. I, you know, I grew up in the hood. My cousin's in prison, you know, all this stuff. I'm trying to help, you know, I'm sending my cousin um, you know, blood in my eye, you know, and they won't even let them get the book, you know, because it's banned in the prisons, you know, mm -hmm. um, shit like that. So, um, but that's just, that's, that's my goal. And I just, I don't know, I'm, I really appreciate, because this video, I'm, I'm showing all of them, like, this going to all mm -hmm. my people. So I really, 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 really appreciate you spending the time. Um, like I said, this was, this, you know, really is in my whole bag. So I was a little, you know, jumping around, but, um, so I hope it, I hope it was I hope it was okay. <laughs> it was it was okay, and thank you, uh, thank you for for being in conversation with me. Hopefully, uh, we will be in conversation again soon. Thank you, thank you.